most minerals are very poorly absorbed. They might be in high concentration of the diet, but the cow may only absorb one or two percent of it. And some of that's for protection. Um, you know, copper, zinc, iron um, actually are detrimental if there's too much of it in the in the body. So the cow down regulates or regulates absorption and only absorbs a small amount of what's in the diet. Welcome to Rumination, the podcast that discusses and shares practical information that impacts the ruminant industry around the world. I am Chris Gwynn, your host, and today I'm with Dr. Bill Weiss, who recently retired from the Ohio State University. Dr. Weiss, as many as you will know, is, was the professor and extension specialist in dairy cattle nutrition at the Ohio State University. But after more than 33 years, as mentioned earlier on faculty, he retired in early of 2021. And I believe from conversation with him, he remains pretty busy. His main area of research areas, which impacted and, and interested him, were factors affecting digestibility of dairy cows, relationships between minerals and vitamins, and the health of dairy cows, and developing methods to incorporate cow and diet variability into ration formulation. Dr. Weiss has published more than 140 peer-reviewed journaled articles and many, many preceding and extension articles. He's won several prestigious ADSA awards and was named a Fellow of the American Dairy Science Association in 2005. He's also a member of ARPAS and a diplomat of the College, American College sorry, of Animal Nutrition. He was a member of the 2001 NRC Dairy Committee and is serving as co-chair in the two, or served, I should say, as a co-chair in the 2021 NRC Dairy Committee. It is a real pleasure to have such a profound contributor to mineral nutrition with us today on the Rumination Podcast. Dr. Weiss, welcome to Rumination, and thanks for joining us today. Good afternoon, Chris, and, and thanks for having me. Today, I'd, I'd like to investigate with you, Dr. Dr. Weiss, mineral kind of bioavailability and, and the practical applications at the farm level. So I'll start off by asking, and I know you've commented this in, in past webinars, but it's good to remind ourselves that um, the models that often that we use for re balancing rations are based on NRC mineral recommendations, which are often defined as the absorbable minerals to maintain adequate labile body stores. And I think you've mentioned in past presentations, it's important to remember that because there are certain possible areas of concern related to those calculations when looking at things like losses and feces, understanding what's stored and how well minerals are absorbed. And wondering if you could review and key on in some of the highlights for the audience to, to remind us of those key important areas. Okay. Well, for most minerals, there's a few exceptions, but for most minerals, what the committee tried to do, we start at the cell um, and we, we calculate, for example, how much mineral goes out in milk, how much mineral is, re if an animal is growing, how much mineral is in that new tissue and how much mineral, if she's pregnant, how much mineral is, be is being deposited in the fetus. And we start there and we, we sum all that up. Mm -hmm. And we say this is how much mineral the cow has to absorb, because if it's not absorbed, it can't go into milk or it can't go into the fetus. So how much mineral has to be absorbed every day? But then we know minerals, most minerals um, are very poorly absorbed. They, they might be in high concentration of the diet, but the cow may only absorb one or two percent of it. Wow. And some of that's for protection. Um, you know, copper, zinc, iron um, actually are detrimental if there's too much of it in the in the body. So the cow down regulates or regulates absorption and only absorbs a small amount of what's in the diet. Um, so some of this is protection. Some of it is the, just the feed. The, the sources aren't available. So it's a combination of the cow regulating absorption and what's what's available. Mm -hmm. And so what we've tried to do is, and there's some unknowns here, but we know minerals from different sources have different absorptions. For the, the, the classic example is, let's say, copper oxide, copper sulfate. They both have copper, obviously, but copper oxide is almost totally unavailable to the cow. Mm -hmm. So the diet concentration, you might say, is perfectly fine, but she doesn't absorb it. 
Whereas with, say, copper sulfate or another source, the concentration may be exactly the same as with the copper oxide, but now it's available to the cow. So we, we've tried to come up with different, what's called availability or absorption coefficients for the different minerals or the different sources um, to, to account for some of this known variation. We, we, again, there's very limited data on this. this is, these are not easy numbers to get, but it's, it's at least a step in the right direction. There's still okay. some, some uncertainty, but it's clearly better than just formulating for a diet concentration rather than making some adjustments for availability or absorption. You talked about apparent absorption is not equal to absorption coefficient and wondering if you could expand a bit more on that and reminding us why that's important. Okay. Well, if, if it was equal, it would make mineral nutrition easy <laughs> because, you know, we measure, we can measure what the cow eats. We can collect fecal samples and measure. That's done a lot for lots of nutrients, energy, protein, et cetera, fiber. It's quite done, done quite commonly under research conditions. But if the absorption of something is regulated, that means the absorption is, is not based on the diet only. It's based on the cow and the diet. And a good example is cow, cows only absorb approximately how much calcium they need, uh, ex with the exception of right around calving because of these big changes in calcium requirement. But let's say a cow, and I'm, I'm making these numbers up here, but let's say a cow needs to absorb 100 grams of calcium a day. And I feed her 200 grams a day. The ab apparent absorption is 50%. Easy math. But let's say I feed her instead of 200, I feed her 300 grams a day. She still only needs 100. She's only going to absorb 100. Now, all of a sudden, the absorption coefficient is 33, yeah. even though I didn't change anything. It's just because that's all the cow needs. So on these regulated things, it, it, theoretically, it could be an accurate indicator of absorption if you fed exactly what the cow needed. But we don't know that because we need to know how, how much they absorb. Yeah. So it's kind of a catch-22. The other problem with minerals, and this is also a problem some with protein, is a lot of times cows absorb more than they need, and but then they get rid of it via, say, bile or other secretions, so it goes back out in the feces. Um, zinc, for example, they absorb it. It's If it's in excess, it's retained in the gut cells. Mm -hmm. These cells are sloughed. And that, that zinc ends up in feces, but it was absorbed. It, the, the feed, the zinc was available, but we would measure it as unavailable. And a lot of these do this th same thing. So for minerals, apparent absorption with a few exceptions really uh, is of almost no value in, in estimating mineral availability. You've also, and this is a growing area of interest, is talking about the gut microbiome. And so we, microbiome, I should say, and you know, we're changing topics a little bit here, but you've talked about in, in some past uh, presentations about uh, the gut microbiome and, and trace mineral nutrition. So what can you tell the audience today about the impact of mineral nutrition, whether positive or negative, on gut microbiome and perhaps where some of the research should be focused? Well, for, for decades, you know, bacteria need minerals just like humans and cows need them. And we've known that for a long time. So that the fact we, we have to feed the rumen bugs and the intestinal bugs in addition to the cows is, is, is well established. And in general, it's been if you feed enough to the cow, the bacteria usually had enough, and that's kind of where we left it. <clears throat> but more recently, um, there's been more and more studies looking at source, not necessarily amount of trace mineral, but source of trace mineral. Examples, organic versus the sulfates or the hydroxies versus the sulfates and so on. And some things we're finding at the, at the what I call the gross level is form of, of trace mineral affects fiber digestion. And fiber is digested only by bacteria so that if you're altering fiber digestion, likely you're changing the rumen population of bacteria. Uh, and several studies have shown that sulfates versus hydroxy or sulfates versus organics, generally fiber digestion is lower when they're fed sul the sulfates. Mm 
so you you could argue well these hydroxies of the organics are stimulating fiber digestion and, and that could be happening i i happen to think the sulfates are inhibiting fiber digestion but it, who knows i mean it, it's you could argue either one but obviously you're changing the population the other more recently and and we published a paper on this is four or five years ago and has since been repeated with a different source but we fed organic zinc and zinc sulfate, same, same concentration. I, I can't remember how much, 60, 70 parts per million. And we collected fecal samples and, and using these molecular, bio, molecular biology techniques, which I don't understand, my graduate student did, but it, it basically looks for different, uh, they used to be called species, now they're called something else, but different types of bacteria in the fecal samples. And what he found is that the cows fed the organic zinc had fewer of the, of the bacteria that's been associated with digital dermatitis in, in feet, so foot rot. Uh, that's since been repeated by another group with hydroxy versus sulfates. So again, this is saying we're cha changing the micro, microbiome of either the intestine or the, or the rumen. When you collect feces, you don't know where the, the change is happening. And so this is with these new techniques we have, this is an area I think we're going to see a whole lot more research because it's, it's easier now to measure responses. And, and we could measure ruminal responses and we can measure intestinal responses. But I think the, the rumen, you know, because of, of nutrient digestibility, pr bacterial protein synthesis is a big, big deal. And then with all this, the gut is a, the intestine is a huge immune organ. It's huge. And so the, a lot of these things we see with the source of trace minerals on immune function, you know, a lot of times we said, oh, they're just more available, but it might be we're actually changing the, the inside the gut and, and both the bacteria and, and the gut, gut tissue. So a lot of these might be at the gut level. So does it go beyond zinc, do you think? Oh yeah, I think zinc was. I think that zinc is the one that's been measured the most. On the fiber digestion, it's been uh, the studies usually use zinc, copper, and manganese in combination. So they haven't been done specifically. To my knowledge, on the intestinal thing, it's only been zinc. And a lot of that was, you know, zinc. Zinc methionine has been shown to improve foot health. This was, I think, why it's been studied the most. But there's no reason now we can't study other other trace minerals and maybe even macro minerals. There's no reason now on that. No, thank you. So speaking of other minerals, talk to me about chromium. Uh, I wouldn't mind taking a few minutes. I know you've done some work on chromium and diets and, and chromium sources and the role of chromium. And really, what is it a, is a number of products on the marketplace? What is a, a nutrition should be looking for? when they're looking, one, to add chromium to ruin a diet, and two, the sources that they're, they're utilizing? Well, in, in the U.S., I don't know other, other countries' rules and regulations, but in the U.S., chromium propionate's the only one that's been approved. Um, and this, this is uh, regulated by FDA because they're worried, or yeah, by FDA, and I think they're most worried about environmental issues. But it, chromium, certain forms of chromium is also toxic. So we need the, 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 the form that we feed is not, or not highly toxic. Other forms of chromium can actually be quite toxic. So it's regulated in the U.S. at uh, uh, 0.5 milligrams per kilogram is the supplemental rate. Again, other countries may have other rules and regulations. Chromium is, is one of these nutrients. We know cows need it. Um, because you know there's there's we can find proteins or substances within in animals not just cows people etc that require chromium to work but it, you know in the new NRC which is now called NASM but we we don't give a recommendation for chromium and people say well if you if it's essential nutrient why don't you do that well part of the problem is no one's ever said uh, identified a chromium deficiency they just we, we you know you we don't have most or I, won't, I don't know on most but a lot of cows are not fed supplemental chromium and they live very productive happy lives um so it's if you can't 
produce a clinical deficiency, it's hard to say this is a requirement. Part of the problem is feeds have chromium. You know, the diets are not free of chromium. Basal diets have chromium, and that might be enough to, to meet their basic requirement. Measuring chromium in feeds is really, really hard, um, and so we have very poor data on actual chromium concentrations. So I, I look at chromium more as the effects of chromium is, is more like a feed additive than a nutrient. It doesn't mean it, it can't be profitable, but it's likely you're not fixing a deficiency. When you supplement chromium, you likely are not fixing a deficiency. You're doing something extra. And chromium does lots of things it, uh, at, a, at a molecular, at a meta metabolic uh, level. It often reduces cortisol, which can help immune function. It uh, affects insulin activity. It affects, it can affect gluconeogenesis or glucose synthesis by the liver. Uh, it can alter the partitioning of nutrients more toward the mammary gland and away from uh, body reserves. And when you look at all these things together, it often, uh, and I haven't re redo, reviewed the literature real recently, but in the past, about two thirds of the studies have shown significant increases in milk production with supplemental chromium at about that rate, at about the 0.5 parts per million rate. A one third shows no effect, but that's a pretty, pretty consistent response. When two out of three times you get more milk and, and responsive and been, you know, three to six pounds of, yeah. of milk per day. So it's not a, not a small change. Uh, almost all the studies have been starting a little bit prepartum, say pre-fresh going to four to six, maybe eight weeks. So it's, it's most of the studies are limited to fresh cows. And I think that's where, um, it's likely to have its biggest effect anyway. So, this is a, a nutrient or a feed additive, however you want to define it, that, that is often profitable. Um, it can, it's been shown, again, to um, improve milk, milk production. It may improve, improve animal health via immune function and some other things. And it can be limited, targeted to pre-fresh-fresh. Fresh. Uh, another benefit, and this isn't unique to chromium, I'm, I'm a big fan of fresh cow diets. Um, first three or four weeks. And these are, if I, have, if I formulated the diet, they're going to be very expensive. There's no, it's going to be, have very high protein, very high quality protein. It's going to have a lot of, of additives that work uh, in fresh cows. Chromium would be in these diets. And what uh, an experiment has found is once you pull it out after t three, four weeks, they continue to produce more milk. And we see that with a lot of, of nutri nutrients in this fresh period. That makes sense. They peak higher and that carries through. So chromium, uh, you know, you can limit it to uh, supplementation of maybe five weeks, a couple weeks prepartum, a couple weeks postpartum, and you're going to receive responses for, for many, many more weeks. So I think it fits very well into situations where you have fresh cow groups, pre-fresh and fresh cow groups. No, yeah, well, thank you for reminding us about the value of chromium in diets. It's certainly one of those nutrients that have caught the attention of nutritionists and producers. And um, so it's great to get some expert advice. So thank you very much. So at this point in the conversation, we always like to try and wrap things up a little bit with some of the key take-home messages that we can remind nutritionists, producers, even veterinarians about mineral nutrition. And since you're one of the global experts, what are the maybe three or four key take-home messages you'd like to leave the audience with when they're thinking about mineral nutrition at the farm level that they need to consider? Well, one of the first things, and, and I, I see a lot of diets, uh, not as many now as I used to, but I see a lot of diets, and minerals are needed, but too much is too much. And very often they're over-supplemented, uh, grossly over supplement both men minerals and vitamins and this adds cost but it also can especially these metals at, at these some of these absurd levels are, are detrimental so I, I remind nutritionists and vets you start with NRC I still think um, that the, the new updated one is probably the best mineral recommendations available right now you start there and, and you should feed more. In most situations, you should feed more than what 
is NRC recommends. But it should be reasonable. And in most situations, from, from calculations I made, is if, if you overfeed, if you, if you formulate a diet for the average cow in a pen, and it says you need, again, I'm making a number up, let's say it says you need 10 parts per million copper to meet the average requirement, I'm going to feed about 20% extra. So in that example, 12. Yeah. And, and I build that 20, 25% into almost all my trace minerals. And in most situations, that, that'll be fine. You, you need to be aware of antagonist, and we know if sulfur and molybdenum, maybe you might have to feed uh, uh, 50% more copper, but not two or three times more copper. So again, be reasonable in, in your over-supplementation. Over-supplement, but be reasonable. Um, the other thing is, is source does matter. We, we know that as we do more and more stuff, I think I'm going to... Um, the data is, I think, clearer on zinc than the other other trace minerals. That organic zinc or uh, not zinc from non-sulfate sources yeah. um, does things that zinc sulfate doesn't. And I typically include some uh, multiple sources of zinc in the diet. May if I have uh, copper, we know copper is subject to a lot of antagonists. Sulfur, if I have high sulfur water. I tend to go to the specialty copper sources, organic or hydroxies. So look at everything on water, uh, mineral composition, your basal diet, and make decisions on sources based on, on those things. But I guess the, the f- biggest thing is be reasonable um, in both feed enough, but, but don't feed too much. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. And I want to thank you for the work you've done, for the research, the leadership in the industry, and in particular in the area of vitamin and mineral research that you've championed over your career. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Surely want to thank our audience for listening to us today. So you can subscribe to our channel at jeffo.ca. That way you won't miss any of our current and past and future episodes of the Rumination Podcast. You can also find us again, jeffo.ca. Apple and Google Podcasts, as well as Spotify. This podcast was brought to you by Jeffo Nutrition, precision nutrition for a growing world. And have a great day.